and I encourage everybody to take their seats. Unfortunately, there are a couple of seats left here in the front if anybody would like to, to claim those prime seats. Um, thank you very much for coming back after enjoying the best uh, Rusi sandwiches available on the market. Uh, we will have, well, I shouldn't call this the best panel because we only have good panels here at Rusi, but this is really a panel of best practices um, for modern deterrence or uh, what one might call modern uh, total defense. And I think what's interesting about modern deterrence or uh, updated total defense is that it's uh, the, the star performers are not the large countries in NATO or, or anywhere else, but a number of smaller countries, and specifically the Scandinavian countries, which perfected the model of total defense, defense during the Cold War. Uh, in fact, Sweden uh, originated it even before the Cold War in response to, uh, um, well, in response to World War II. Uh, but they perfected this model during the Cold War, and now most more recent uh, additions are uh, the, uh, the Baltic uh, states. But, of course, a lot has changed since the Cold War, and, and so we have to change how we think about uh, total defense and, and societal resilience as part of it, and how we combine traditional deterrence and military force with societal resilience. So. Um, no country has got it right yet, but the, the good news for us as the West or as developed countries is that we have a number of excellent models, each in a particular area, uh, pioneered by, by a number of countries, uh, that are represented here right in front of you, uh, specifically the people who are in charge of uh, those policies and the implementation of them in their respective countries. I'm very pleased that all five agreed to be here. And with that, I'll turn the panel over to Joe Sternberg, who uh, very kindly sacrificed election day and his duties at the Wall Street Journal to be here to talk about modern deterrence, but it's, of course... Uh, not much of a sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, uh, we will uh, have uh, 90 minutes of conversation and I think Joe will make sure that, that we uh, stay on time. And uh, over to you, Joe. Uh, great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thanks to the, the good people at RUSI for, for hosting the, what has been a very interesting session today. Uh, and I really want to try to get us into our discussion as quickly as possible, so I'm just going to say a few words to introduce myself, and then instead of you know, doing a, a read-through of the biography that you've already been provided for each of our uh, panelists, I will just ask them to introduce themselves in turn as we go along, and I think that we'll be aiming for about uh, a 10-minute opening statement, which I've warned them I will strictly enforce uh, before we can get to the, the audience Q&A. Uh, so as Elizabeth said, I'm an uh, editorial board member and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal based here in London, uh, and a lot of my work straddles the political and the uh, economic and business spheres. So this has been a very interesting day for me when we're, uh, you're talking about some of these issues that I think do require a high degree of participation from, from all of those uh, elements to try to deal with a lot of the new threats that we're talking about. And Elizabeth, uh, you described this as the best practices panel. I mean, the way I, I have thought about it is that it's an experimentation panel. And so I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, you know, all of the, the policy innovation that has been going on uh, in a lot of these countries, primarily in the uh, Nordic or Baltic part of the world, um, you know, that might offer some lessons for, for the rest of us. So with, with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to the gentleman immediately to my left, uh, Mads Eklund, who is going to tell us a, a little bit about uh, who he is and uh, you know, the experience in his part of the world with some of these uh, modern threats. Thank you very much. Okay, I will just press the button. Thank you very much, and thank you to Ruti for this opportunity to speak to you about the Danish uh, experience and what we have learned from trying to engage with, with the private sector when building resilience. Uh, I hope that your expectations are not too high. We, I will personally not be able to provide the answer for everything. Those who are readers of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy knows that the answer to everything is 42. So with that one out of the way, 
Um, I work on a daily basis at the Ministry of Defense uh, in Denmark. My uh, my area will be uh, emergency management and it will also be the Home Guard and a little bit about the Arctic, but we will not touch upon that today. I have previously worked at the Danish Emergency Management Agency and that's where we did a lot of experimentation when it came to how can we develop this relationship with the private sector. But before we turn to what we did, let's take uh, a brief look at uh, what we are up against. Because let's face it, we, things have changed a little bit since, uh, since the, the height of the Cold War. First of all, we have a much broader risk spectrum uh, today than we used to have. And I say that in the sense it's both real, and but it's also perceived because back in the 90s, 1950s, 1960s and so on, we still had to deal with terrorism. We still had to deal with uh, natural disasters and so on. But war was sort of the overriding problem. When the Cold War ended, uh, we became much more aware of the damages that can be caused by nature, by technology, especially when technology fails, and also non-state actors. And now this has sort of widened even more. We have added to that the hybrid threats, we have added cyber threats, but we have kept on with, uh, with sort of traditional military threats uh, as well as, uh, as nature and technology. Another important issue that has changed is the ownership of uh, critical infrastructure. Previously, it used to be owned and operated by government, which meant that we as government and institution had a huge leverage over how this was, uh, how this was carried out and also what they should be able to contribute in times of war. Back then, it was, uh, now we're talking about enablement, that was a very real thing in war planning before, uh, but it was a little bit easier because we actually could uh, use the leverage that we had. Um, it would be transport, energy and communication, but also uh, in terms of health and in terms of media. All these things have sort of gone over more or less to private hands today. What has also changed is the, uh, the, the, the need for crisis management capability. Back when war was an issue, we had these huge crisis management exercises and everybody was focused on having the plans ready and having them tested. When the Cold War ended, I think that um, a lot of the, uh, the, the virtues about crisis management was all but forgotten. Why should we bother? Um, as our previous panel spoke about, we had some wake-up calls, especially the Y2K and of course, uh, September 11th at, in 2001. So again, the, the need for crisis management capability uh, started to rise again and it was back on the agenda. When it comes to uh, engaging the private sector, I think it's important to, uh, to notice the legacy. I've worked with this for 15 years and ever since I started, there has been a lot of good uh, a lot of good intentions, mutual good intentions, I would say. Everybody agrees that it makes sense that public and private work together to resolve these issues. But we haven't had that much traction, I'm sorry to say. Our legacy is that we as governments, we do like regulation. Uh, we all, and we also like to think that we got this. So whenever government says we got this, things tend to go a little bit off track. Um, it usually becomes very one-sided and also biased towards our requirements. What is it that we need from the private sector? Um, but what I've also seen is, and that's part of the legacy as well, that we are mutually unaware of each other's knowledge and capabilities. When I talk to private companies and, and tell them about the crisis management system that we has, have set up in Denmark, nobody knows about it. It's not because it's a secret, it's out there. We have publications explaining everything on the web, but it's simply just not a part of, of that discussion. Um, when we, if we take this in and we realize that things have changed, we also need to change our approach. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, 
given the changed circumstances and our lack of traction, I think it's very important that we, at this particular moment, start to think about how should we, how should we do this? We should reinvent uh, and and it, it and reconsider our approach to interaction. Let me give you three brief Danish examples. And again, these are small samples. These are experiments. But I think we managed to, uh, to get some good lessons out of this. We had a crisis management conference in 2016 where we invited top managers from, uh, from government and the CEO level from uh, the larger Danish corporations because we wanted to bring them together to show them that they have some very shared challenges. That is in terms of the threats that they're facing, but also how to deal with these threats, how to uh, get your crisis management system up and running. We also tried to show them that threats are not just something external, it's also internal. It's the cases, the really bad ones, that can bring down careers and bring down companies. These require crisis management capabilities as well. We pulled together a group of capability builders um, again, looking at four major Danish companies, they are multinationals, and then uh, the Danish Emergency Management Agency. And why did we choose those? Because when we look at these companies, their size and their complexity and their challenges are very similar to ours when we are in government. And that means that it becomes much easier to discuss these issues and it becomes much easier to sort of transfer knowledge from one party to the other. Because if we go down to the sort of the little um, auto shop on the corner and start talking to them about advanced crisis management, that would be a mistake. But it, when we are dealing with the larger organizations, they have the capability and the muscles to pull this off. But also, and most importantly, they have their own experiences that we can use. So what we discussed with this group was uh, how to conduct crisis management on the strategic level. How do you involve CEOs? What procedures and methods can they use when they're trying to save, uh, save their company in times of crisis? The last example, it is our, crisis, or our national crisis management exercises. We do them every two years. And for a number of years, we have, had, uh, we have invited outsiders, so to speak. We have invited media corporations, the real ones, not just some we make up for the day, but the real ones, the Danish Broadcasting Corporation and others. We have invited foreign embassies in Denmark. Uh, we have had the uh, UK embassy involved for a number of times. Because whenever something goes wrong in our part of the world, there's always some foreigners involved in that. And we need to be able to, to deal with the embassies and their needs as well. And then we have involved private companies. So come inside, be part of this exercise. Because what we can do is we can offer something that private companies cannot buy for money. Because we have a setup which is basically everyone in government, right from the prime minister's office all the way down to local incident command. And that's very, very difficult to pull together, especially if you want to have the real stakeholders involved. A couple of observations to, uh, to conclude my presentation. First of all, I think it's very important that when we start dealing with, with the private sector, we should aim for something where both, both sides get something out of this. There should be real added value. Because going back to regulation and that being one-sided, having uh, projects, uh, activities and so on where both parties get something, that is usually the start of a good friendship. Um, but we also need to make sure that it is real added value because private companies, I've learned, they value their time, they value their effort, and they value their money. So if we can't do something uh, of substance, they will quickly pull out, which is reasonable enough. We should also be able to work on something which is relevant and transferable um, and relevant to give you an example, right now we're talking about enablement in NATO. How do we make sure that we can move forces from, from countries across NATO to the places where they need it? That is something that's a very real challenge, and that's something very tangible, and that's where we have to start involve, 
involving private companies. They own the ports, they own the airports, they have huge say in transport infrastructure and so on. But it's very, very tangible. That's a good place to start because just phoning them up and asking, are you prepared for war? They'll probably hang up. Um, and then we should make sure that we give access because what we have as government, and I touched upon that with the crisis management exercise, we have something which, which is valuable when shared. We can give that access. We can discuss methods and so on. Government usually develop methods, methodology uh, on these issues. And the private companies, even the big ones, don't. We can share that. But they can give us something back. They can give us the experience. What have they tried in the real world? And together, we can make something very useful out of that. So to conclude this brief presentation, I'd say one of the things that we should consider when, when, when working with private, uh, the private sector is changing or sort of adding on to our traditional role in government as crisis leader and as regulator, but also seeing it as facilitator. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Matt. And uh, now I think that our, our journey takes us from Denmark up to Finland with uh, a presentation from uh, Dr. Antti Silenpe about uh, what, what it, he is up to. Thank you. And thank you for the organizers. It's, um, I'm honored to be here. And I, I felt so honored that, like, going contrary to my, my old habits, I even wrote a speech. And and I noticed that I did a mistake immediately because, like, I, my, my point was I'm going, I was going to brag about, like, here I say this sentence, Finnish concept of comprehensive security is a time-tested model. Like, I'm, I'm, I was going to uh, brag about something that is old and what we have done long time. And we were, uh, in the morning, Professor Thomas told that, let's forget our old playbooks. And I was going to say that, yes, well, I think we have a pretty good playbook. But <laughs> So, well, anyway, I, I still try to do this. And uh, I will also um, going to talk about that, that um, talk about, about that, that old playbook about the Finnish concept of comprehensive security and how it was born and how it has been developed. It was born because of necessity and uh, because actually we didn't have time we didn't have the resources to build these silos building silos is a very expensive hobby get some cheaper hobbies <laughs> and uh, then like why we have carried out why we have not lost it it was of course because of luck and pragmatism not big ideas uh, to be to be honest we have kept it, we have polished it, we have keep, keep, uh, kept polishing it. And now uh, in the following minutes, I will talk about the basic ingredients of that system and then, then uh, focus on our recent case, that is the preparations for our parliamentary elections in April 2019. So at the core of the Finnish concept is trust and collaboration among security actors and maybe not anymore like the hard security actors, for example, Ministry of Health, because it owns so many vital records, it's, it's important. Also, business community and, and organizations and citizens. As a written format, like we have had this strategy, uh, the first version, 2003, now, now we are running a uh, fourth update, it's 2017. And um, in that strategy, we, we have a joint understanding what kind of threats there are and what are the basic uh, operating uh, principles. There are seven cross-sectoral functions. Those functions, they have to work uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, they, um, those are like really the essence, what, what there has to be protected. And we can summarize this, this whole uh, thing in sentence. The Finnish concept for comprehensive security means that society's vital functions, those are the seven, are secured through collaboration between the authorities, the business community, organizations, and citizens, four uh, important communities. 
In practice, we take care of the societal's vital functions together with, with all these actors. So if we, if we start with this first one, the authorities, the competent authorities, be that civilian or military, they are responsible for their own preparedness and readiness. There is no like some kind of ministry of whatever uh, coming and, and sorting things out. They are, they are responsible, they are responsible uh, 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 and they get support from the others. And communication flows vertically from ministry to the agencies and back, also back. And then uh, attempt is that also uh, horizontally among the ministries and, and agencies. And in practice, lots of this work is carried out in, in cross-sectional uh, bodies. Like we have the permanent secretaries, like the, the, the number one civil servants. They, they are there, they are the security committee. And uh, it's supported also like the heads of all the security agencies are there. Then uh, heads of uh, preparedness and secretaries of uh, preparedness that kind of cross-sectional bodies. You have, to, you have to know the names, you have to know these people. And then also uh, project teams. Second, uh, as an example, authorities, authorities leverage business community services more and more. Like in the previous examples, we have lost the control of critical infrastructure. So how to get these people uh, back in, in track? Of course, nowadays, more things are done on commercial basis. You have to pay these companies that they do the, the, the patriotic act and patriotic thing and, 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 and do the good thing. But um, sometimes uh, they, they sometimes they are working for their own self-interest, but that is also good for the, for the, for the country. If they take preemptive measures when they try to like uh, manage possible disruptions. If one company does it, and the second, and the third, and the one thousandth, then like as a cumulative thing, the whole nation uh, is better prepared, more resilient. Then organizations, NGOs, they play a significant role, especially at latter uh, phases of, of crisis. When the migration crisis was, was bad, 2015, uh, Red Cross uh, took uh, care seventy percent of the refugee housing, and fourth, uh, we also want to involve citizens in our concept. Uh, of course, they may be part of these NGOs, but then, then um, we also want to want to uh, tell the people that they should uh, they should also have some. Uh, uh, security of supplies. We don't put it to 10, 10 days, but like 72 hours. And uh, here I can add that, like there was a, vis a, rev a revision from the strategy from uh, like in this 2017. Earlier, we didn't explicitly state that citizens are there. Now we have, not only because this 72 or this kind of maintenance or security of supply thing, no. It came from the world's world of cyber and world of uh, information. Because like in the, uh, there we understood that in the cyber security, citizens are also actors. And now we, uh, we know that, that psychological resilience is so important and it starts from the, from the people. So recent developments in cyberspace and information space have put more emphasis on resilience of the of a of a common man. So we have shifted from from this total defense thing more to this uh, 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 towards comprehensive security, which has meant uh, we think that we are more responsive to new kind of threats. Uh, there are a couple of things which we see that are are, are benefits of this kind of of, of refocusing. One is that we think that um, uh, we have to acknowledge that preparation for one kind of incident is, uh, is also good for another. Organi or organizing or, or training exercises uh, in, in, for countering natural disaster is not so different if you tackle man-made issues or man-made threats. 
you have to know who to call and uh, you have uh, and if possible you should know know the other guy and that's why all the actors should be involved in in cooperation and trainings w earlier in the, in the morning we talked about about these things these different kind of different partners that they should like feel that they are real stakeholders then they are willing to put resources in this so ministry of defense cannot like just run these things or prime minister's office or or uh, or home office what, or what, whatever and the other good thing about this uh, co comprehensive security thing is that that in in our, our kind of thinking is that the competent authority remains the same like let's say there is a small incident and it becomes bigger and bigger like if we have the competent authority the same as long as possible then it eases this transitioning from a, like little incident to a major major thing maybe even like transition it's a wrong word like it's like like there are no shifts or years or what is the word anyway you know you know what i mean and um, then if i take a, an, a recent example in finland Elections is not a crisis. I, I've, I've been told in some countries the elections are, is a crisis, but I think like in I feel that is like a part and partial why why we are here. We want to protect our open and free free societies. So elections is a good thing. Our election system is very robust. Like people, they really go to this booth. They write with pencil the number, and then everything like very very simple. And all the parties, they are observants, so they can monitor what the other guys are doing. So lots of check and everything can be checked later. That part is very robust. So the, in the, the major threat is not coming from that part. It's coming from the information space. So people, they, people might, might want to like, uh, break the, break, not break the system, break the mentality or, or people's thinking. So we, we established, so this is a new thing, we established a cross-sectional team. Competent authority is Ministry of Justice, so MOD is supporting, I am one of them, and then uh, Prime Minister's Office, but also our security police and uh, cyber authorities, they are involved. And so we are, our mandate starts from lecture, uh, like uh, more of a training package, educational stuff, but then uh, then um, we also give lectures to media and even political parties about the political or about the pot potential information activities targeted at us or at them. And we work with the business and NGOs. So again, they are not only the objects of our actions, they are making security as well. So we have, we have noticed that these elections, they suit very well on this big idea of that we want to get everyone, everyone on, on, on board. And we've noticed already that this has been very, very good, good exercise that we have uh, refreshed our contacts and uh, made them more uh, clearer, especially with the cyber community and government uh, communicators here. Role, role of business community and NGOs has been important. However, I have to say, like I'm, I'm fond of transparency. Our, our contacts with social media giants are not like at full speed. Speed, those international companies, a couple of them. And then, but then international cooperation here in this field, very important. And uh, it's uh, in, in ma very many cases, it's uh, well, in order to detect anomalies, but also for best practices. Lots of the things that, that, that we have been done is a copy pasting from Sweden. Thank you, Sweden. Um, yes, so we might be on track on the elections thing, but we are not, we are not happy yet. We, with the elections, we have not won uh, any, anything. Even the nicest models and structures do not do these tasks. There's lots of work to be done between today and voting day. And today it's exactly 159 w days of working together towards this common goal. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. And from uh, Finland, I believe we now head to uh, Latvia to hear about uh, some efforts that are underway there from uh, Janis Garrisons. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rusi, for inviting me. Uh, I will not uh, try to repeat, uh, but it seems to me that uh, we following one, probably we choose uh, uh, different ways, but uh, we use uh, the same uh, patterns. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to um, total defenses, uh, uh, Finland and Sweden has uh, their own uh, historical experience. We also have uh, our Soviet experience, uh, which we probably not so keen to explore uh, in order not to ruin our uh, economy um, as Soviet Union did. Um, but uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, for us, it's uh, why it's uh, uh, probably natural because uh, since the regaining of independence, somebody always tried to mandle in our elections. In of internal affairs and it's not something new it's uh, you know you discovered that it's something new for us it's not, nothing new um, uh, and uh, we always been I uh, happy now that we finally not uh, regarded as uh, you know small wooden uh, forest freaks uh, uh, who uh, you know a dream uh, who are afraid of um, uh, who uh, you know uh, infiltrated uh, poisoned by rustophobia um, it seems that uh, others now explore, uh, uh, yielding those results at uh, the previous um, uh, policy. Um, what we, I think, what we realize, uh, especially uh, after 2014, that um, the, uh, all components are very important. We started with a military um, uh, component, but uh, um, two years ago we realized that uh, basically um, the military is important, but you, ha you, you can't um, win the war if your population is brainwashed. And basically, uh, at one point, uh, it's not about so much uh, um, uh, battle about territory, but battle about uh, people about the uh, brain of the people uh, and one, if your population is brainwashed uh, uh, on daily basis uh, you, uh, you can build one, uh, whatever strong military you will fail anyway because they will not be will of the people and therefore we we decided that we have to move and uh, we actually what we did I would talk about three uh, three things and then first uh, I think is awareness I think uh, uh, we saw how uh, lack of awareness actually played in Ukraine because uh, uh, diplomats in Brussels were not able to figure out whose tanks are, um, uh, you know, uh, attacking Ukraine, uh, apparently there's a big canyon in between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. But uh, I think that uh, is uh, the problem. Uh, it's not about only diplomats' problem. It's also society problem. Once you're not talking about uh, to your population, and I think we, um, we still have not learned how to talk to with our people. There's, uh, you know, information uh, over, um, uh, too much probably information, but governments don't know how to talk to population. Uh, the simple things are not explained. Uh, and I think that is the biggest issue for uh, right now because uh, everybody lives in their own bubble, but we, the government don't know how to explain uh, basic things. Where previously it was uh, easy. There was Russian newspaper propaganda now uh, and our propaganda and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, the fight between those two newspapers. Now you can't control those things and, and uh, how actually to reach and uh, the, the, the citizen and society, and uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, very important. Therefore, we started actually uh, talking to, uh, to um, big um, uh, CAOs, uh, to, to media, um, be organizing um, actually uh, lectures in schools, be talking uh, separately to, to, um, uh, to uh, teachers as well, because what we understand, if you will not talk to your society, um, uh, you will lose. Because they are confused, actually. Believe it or not, society is confused. Even you can, uh, you, we, we sometimes sitting in our offices think that they know everything. No, they don't know anything. And they are very confused about what is going on. And we somehow, uh, um, you know, in denial of that. Uh, and therefore, we, uh, we have to talk about our weaknesses because, and we have to uh, um, be aware of uh, our weakness because uh, it's not about what Russia is doing. It's about we not able to cope with our weaknesses. 
because if they, they will not be Russia, there will be somebody else who will be doing the same things if we will not solve our weaknesses. Uh, and uh, we believe that social media is, uh, you know, Arab Spring that uh, will promote democracy. But uh, nobody looked at basically at the end it turned against us and we are not, uh, and we're not able to cope with that. Uh, and therefore, we, I think we, it's very important to talk with society about and discover those vulnerabilities and weaknesses and, and, and deal with those if you want to survive as, as, as democracies. Then uh, the th second point is uh, uh, what are we doing its action. You have to take action in, uh, in several, uh, first of all, you, sometimes you have to release more intelligence as you previously did because you want to inform society. You have to um, uh, uh, communicate what you are doing prior to somebody, uh, prior to somebody else communicate because if you, uh, once you are too late, that's that narrative, not yours narrative is spread. And, uh, and it's very important to be proactive. If, you, if you're not proactive, then Russia will spread its uh, narrative and then you're in defensive and, and it's, it doesn't work. And you have to penalize, uh, you have to penalize uh, uh, or criminalize different things like uh, hatred of war, uh, you know, speech of war. That is not acceptable to our societies and let's uh, penalize those things. Uh, uh, and it doesn't matter when this ho happened, either in newspaper, on TV or in the social media, because there should be some kind of framework which we are not accept. If we, uh, you know, if we um, uh, don't deal with those issues, then, some, uh, then we are simply no, not in control of our societies or of, of our territories. And of course, cyber. I think cyber is the most uh, difficult one, and if you uh, because uh, um, you have to deal and run, basically you have to understand what's going on in, in your cyberspace uh, um, and uh, where those critical points are. Um, uh, <clears throat> and and of course the last thing is outreach activities. So we're doing a lot of outreach activities, and this, that is uh, uh, and I would uh, I want to praise Canadians. Uh, actually, they every rotation does. 400, uh, almost uh, 400 uh, outreach activities. Uh, they, uh, and that is uh, basically Canadian so, uh, soldiers, without soldiers uh, being uh, in, 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 in different uh, social events, that is the best way how to counter uh, any uh, hostile narrative, because that you don't need uh, uh, to produce your own propaganda. Um, then uh, on, uh, uh, but uh, if you look on 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 longer term, that is, I think the issue is about resilience, uh, resilience of population. Because what's happening, uh, uh, I think, uh, and we uh, certainly feel it on daily basis. Because uh, uh, there is not only information warfare, but uh, there is the attempt is psychologically um, uh, psychologically if, uh, affect your population, people, and they. Whenever, um, you know, and I'm uh, always like uh, to refer to rants, 72 hours, uh, uh, you know, the Russians will be in Riga in 72 hours, uh, probably it was good uh, uh, academically, but uh, from uh, PR, uh, from strategic communication, it was disaster, uh, because that immediately throw into um, um, psychological fear, uh, all our population. When Rand published, I would not uh, say whether I agree, I certainly disagree with Rand. But uh, um, uh, that is something we have to develop uh, uh, psychological resilience. Because, um, and how you can develop psychological resilience, the population has to be sure that they, if anything happens, even if war happens, they have to know what to do. And therefore, what we actually decided to go. Uh, not to replicate Soviet system, but uh, uh, to develop uh, a comprehensive defense. Uh, comprehensive defense meaning that basically um, uh, develop the system which uh, includes different kind of uh, different areas of, 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 of life, uh, including also psychological defense, because you have the people will be um, uh, resilient if they are sure that uh, even uh, you know, even if war happens, they know what to do, and they are sh uh, and they not afraid of of uh, you know um, of any kind of uh, psychological I I um, interferences. Um, and what we did, we actually we uh, we didn't uh, started with uh, uh, as always uh, collecting a lot of papers and writing theory, but we already for the 
fourth year, uh, we have uh, governmental exercise for the government exercise, and, and actually this year was uh, um, the fourth year when government had exercise, government was actually taken into a remote area. We tried to in, uh, ensure um, all communication and how the government will communicate to the society, uh, but also we took some um, uh, already uh, in this exercise play uh, some part of mobilization, including private sector, uh, including the private banks actually were very um, enthusiastic of uh, uh, commercial banks, uh, bank, uh, banks because uh, let's say you lose your internet or electricity, how you will deliver cash? You will be immediately, in, your country will be immediately in turmoil because, uh, you know, that is, I think, crucial issue. Why? And if the banks are not keeping, uh, keeping their rec records in place or they keep, uh, in many cases, they keep, keep those records uh, abroad and the cable, for example, is cut, you simply will not be able to get those da uh, that data. And, uh, and, and you don't need anything, you know, you don't need military attack even on that. Therefore, uh, we actually try to um, uh, deal with all those issues uh, uh, through the exercise and now um, when we saw those parts of different exercises uh, um, uh, how to put that on in theory in civil defenses so basically that is uh, old style civil defenses with a modernization and um, um, of course I can talk a lot of uh, many other uh, details but I think the last thing what we are looking now is uh, because if we want to survive in long term it's about uh, the values we have to define the values uh, what is our society uh, societies are if we are not sure if uh, people are not sure about the, our, val our values what they are ready to fight for then uh, sorry to say uh, we can develop everything uh, uh, you know all those hostile ideologies that are around us they will win at the one point because they are very pushy thank you very much Thank you. And uh, now we'd like to turn to Tommy Akeson, who comes to us from uh, Sweden, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, developments there. Yeah, thank you very much to him for inviting me, and it's a great honor for me to speak in, in, in um, front of such a distinguished audience. My name is Tommy Åkesson, and I am the Secretary General of the Swedish Defense Commission. That means that I am the senior civil servant in the parliamentary and the defense commission composing of all parties of the parliament. So what I do together with my staff is writing all the papers for the politicians. Uh, I will give a short briefing of the, of the Swedish approach to modern deterrence based on the defense commission latest report that was delivered to the government in December last year. Resilience, the total defense concept, and the development of civil defense 2021 to 2025. It's 250 pages, so this would be really a short version of, of what's, what's in the report. But there is an article in NATO Review from April where, where the chairman, Bjorn von Sydow, is actually explaining most of the, of, of, of the things written in the report. And it's in English, the report in 250 pages in Swedish. So. There's very few of us who could read it, I suppose. Um, first, a few words about the Defense Commission. The Defense Commission is a forum for consultation between the government and all eight parties in the parliament regarding the future development of Swedish security and defense policy. So the defense minister is giving the tasking to the Defense Commission to look into main topics of the future development of the Swedish defense and security policy. And in practice, this means that you have an agreement with the majority in the parliament before the government write the bill to the parliament. It's quite convenient. Uh, and you won't have any big discussions within the parliament regarding defense and security policy. It's also a way of, to be honest, educate politicians in defense and security policy because they spend a lot of time in the Defense Commission's work, more than they spend in their committees, for example, the Defense Committee, regarding the specific topics of development of the, Sw the Swedish defense and security policy. And now uh, the work in the Defense Commission that started up in 2017 is preparing two reports as inputs for the next defense bill that will be taken by the government in the summer of 2020 or the parliament in the summer of 2020 with the, with, the, with the bill to the parliament in the spring of, of 2020. 
and it will be in effect from 1st of January 2021 for five years. The first report that I mentioned was delivered in December 2017. This focuses on the future development of Sweden's total defence, putting particular emphasis on the so-called civil defence. The next report will be delivered in May next year, and it will cover the Swedish defence and security policy aspects, as well as the strategic directions for the armed forces. Uh, first, some view about the concepts of total defence. When we talk about total defense in Sweden, it's not the Ludendorff meaning of the First World War. Uh, it's very much the democratic way of, of absorbing all resources in society for war, and it was in, more or less invented due to the Second World War and developed during the Cold War. According to the Swedish law, total defense is defined as the preparations and planning required to, the, to prepare Sweden for war. So it's very much connected to war. The thing is today, war is a bit different from, from past, but still the regulation is very much concerned about war. If the government can declare highest alert, all societal functions are defined as total defense. And total defense concepts consist of both military defense and civil defense, which means that all civilian parts engage in total defense and therefore engage in total defense, and therefore lays out a whole society approach to security. <coughs> When I say civil defense, it's not kind of shelters. It could be that, uh, of course, but it's everything that is not military in society. It could be kindergartens. And we have legal system that regulates all of this, including private companies and everything. We got rid of a lot of things of the so sec after the Cold War, but we kept the legal framework. And that's a really a strength in developing the new, new total defense concept. Uh, in accordance then, the parliament, the government, government authorities, municipalities, private companies, voluntary defense organizations, as well as individuals are all part of the Swedish total defense. Up until the end of the Cold War, Sweden had a systematic and well-developed total defense concept encompassing all of society. Arguably, Sweden was in practice one of the most militarized states in Western Europe. There were plans for everything, including the armed forces that had the size of 800,000 of mobilization. So my father, that was a farmer, his tractor, farmer tractor, was actually part of the wartime organization in the army. And he was part of the army, of course. Uh, for many years, there has been no systematic planning and preparation for wartime conditions. We still do have the legal framework. And due to the deteriorating security situation, this type of total defense planning resumed with the Swedish Defense Bill back in 2015. As a result, government authorities were assigned to once again start planning for wartime uh, conditions. However, however, up until now, there has been limited strategic directions or defined ambitions of, of these planning efforts. And that's what the uh, Defence Commission has looked into in the report from December last year. Uh, in Sweden, like most European countries, the developments in 2014 both brought defence and security policy back on the agenda. When it comes to upgrading our national military capability, Sweden is once again focusing on increasing the ability to resist and counter an armed attack against our territory. That has not been the case for the last 20 years. It's been uh, uh, out-of-area operations. In the Commission's December report, we conclude that instability and unpredictability characterize the global security situation. Uh, a larger European conflict could start with an attack on Sweden. If Sweden is attacked and at war, the Commission's assessment is that parts of Swedish territory will see intensive combat with severe consequences locally and regionally. This is also part of, of the total defense concept. Uh, given this, the Defense Commission suggests measures to develop the total defense concept. This includes measures to meet an armed attack against Sweden, including acts of war on Swedish territory. By clarifying that an attack against Sweden will be costly, the total defense concept, together with diplomatic, political, and economic measures, will deter an aggressor from attacking. Sweden 
attacking Sweden or executing, ex ex exerting influence by military means. In the extreme situation, the Tulta defense must have a credible war fighting capability with both military and civil defense. Uh, in traditional or rather theoretical terms, deterrence has been seen either as deterrence by denial or deterrence by punishment. Our small state approach to deterrence is by deterring by systematic planning and preparedness. Uh, by signaling our resolve and taking concrete preparatory measures, we aim to deter an aggressor from even trying. The cost of an attack will be too high, while the chances, chances of success too low. And of course, there is a problem with the cyber domain. But we need also to have offensive cyber capability to at least have some sort of instrument to, to, to have a, a deterrent effect on, on a potential aggression. In a severe secu security crisis, the Commission argued that Swedish society must prepare for three months of serious disturbances. Part of this time there will be, uh, also be war. And when we talk about serious disturbances, it's not keeping the society working as is due a normal day. We're talking about electricity grids will be out by 50 to 80 percent. We need to prepare the, the, the essential parts of society still working. With for example, with reserve electricity power plants. We need to look into how to feed people, and that's not the kind of choosing what you want to eat today. It's now down to what you call it, kilocalories kilocalori a day to survive for three months. If you don't have this kind of planning, you are not prepared for what can happen. Uh, in the mounting of credible defense, the willingness to defend the country and having support from the people in the defense efforts are key factors to success. Residents and decision makers, and they're very important with decision makers as well, alike must be aware of what wartime conditions require of them. Awareness is necessary to withstand the initial shock and resist an attack. In the report, the Commission underlines that the individual has a responsibility, and that had been mentioned earlier today, uh, and I may do some clarifications. In the crisis or, or war, we suggest that each individual that is healthy uh, should be prepared to manage his or her basic provision for a week without public support. We have had 72 hours in Sweden, and to be honest, that's too short time. It's impossible to die in 72 hours, except for if you go out middle of winter in Sweden without clothes, then you die. But otherwise, 72 hours do not really need people to think. A week, they need to think, and they need to be prepared. Uh, so there is, of course, a lot of challenges before us. Over the last few decades, Sweden has, like most other countries, gone through considerable societal change. For example, our society is dependent on electricity, information technology, communication, transportation, fuel, and financial services. Public services that government previously operated are now under private ownership, sometimes even under Russian private ownership. These changes are important preconditions for resuming the, social, the total defense planning in Sweden. We are very much aware of this, and we need to develop quite a different way of doing it compared to how it was done during the Cold War. In the report, the Commission presents a number of suggestions that would strengthen the cap capability of the total defense to meet an armed attack as well as a hybrid situation. In our, from our point of view, look at state aggression against Sweden, and they use the whole spectrum of, of instrument, including conventional military force and what's called hybrid. Uh, instruments for, 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 for uh, uh, trying to achieve their, their strategic goal. Uh, so the suggestions that we have in the report range from, from everything from uh, home protection, health care, all the way to cyber, cyber and psychological defense. So we have been looking into almost all parts of society and see what's, what's the vulnerabilities and what we can do with, with kind of reinforcing the, the t it from a total defense concept. But it is important that this is 
is to say it is impossible if you have an aggressor from another state, a big state to the east. It is impossible to keep to keep the society on the service level you have in peacetime. That is not impossible. That is not possible. And it also impossible. And it also it also important to stress that hybrid threats is new, but they do not. Uh, uh, only be hybrid threats because they are new. There are still old threats. And they, the aggressor will use those parts of his portfolio where we are the weakest. So when we, if we invest everything in hybrid threats and nothing in military, then he will use the military instrument. We need to invest in all of them. Uh, now the Defense Commission focuses it works mainly on the future development of the military defense and our security policy. And we will report to the government in, in May, as I said earlier. In all, this will mean a substantial increase of the defense spending up until 2025. The investment will go into the civil, civil part, civilian part of, of the total defense, the preparations for civil defense and so on, uh, and strengthening both of the Army, Air Force and Navy. Conscription will increase. Being a small country with 10 million people, it's impossible to support a credible armed forces just with volunteers. Uh, we left conscription in 2010 and reactivated it in 2018. Uh, cyber defense and intelligence capability will also be improved. We will invest a lot in cyber intelligence. In all, we aim to increase the resilience of the society and thus the deterrence capabilities of, of Sweden. And that ends my briefing. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And I, I think our uh, final speaker is going to be uh, Indrik Scherp, who comes to us from Estonia. Well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Yes, my name is Indrik Sirp. I work for the Estonian government office. Um, I'm the one whose task is to coordinate all the Estonian government uh, um, actions in national security and defense for the government. My background has been in the Ministry of Defense for many, many years, so now I've been rotated to the, to the government office. As a last speaker, many things have been said, actually, and, and uh, you will hear in my remarks as well some of the terms, some of the thoughts that other countries have uh, and have in practice. So it just shows you how well best practices spread, I guess. So when it comes to Estonia, our national defense is based on a deterrent strategy that stands on two pillars. Uh, first, comprehensive national defense, and the second, the NATO collective defense. And I will focus on the, on the first pillar here. So what does it mean, comprehensive national defense? Well, put simply, it means that the national defense is not only the business of a soldier or an MOD official. Many more institutions and many more people are involved and engaged in this effort. So the task of the comprehensive national defense is to defend and prepare for the defense of Estonia um, against both military as well as non-military threats. Uh, which threaten our national security, our sovereignty, our territorial integrity, and uh, uh, national security uh, in general. So there are six areas that we work through when we think about and act in national defense. Resilience of the government and the society, international activities, homeland security, civilian support for the military, strategic communication, and last but not least, military defense. So what do we do to make it work? I would highlight uh, four uh, work streams. First, command and control. The second, planning. The third one is exercises. And the fourth one, resilience. So when it comes to the, to the uh, command and control at the national level, at the government level, then the government has been given what well, the government, first of all, is the main player, the main manager of national defense. The Government Security Committee, which is the committee consisting of eight ministers, so half of the cabinet almost, and it's chaired by the Prime Minister, is the main political level 
uh, coordination mechanism. So this mechanism has been given some new powers and new tasks over the recent years to do this coordination for, for the government. Also, government office uh, has been given new functions, new tasks to cope with this work and this task. Uh, so my section, for instance, has expanded over the few uh, previous years, and we are responsible for the security committee, we are responsible for all the major defense and secu security documents that go to the government for decision making, and we are also responsible for providing situation awareness uh, for the government, and for the prime minister for that matter which we are doing now um, through a new capability, National SITS and National Situation Centre, which has started its work uh, recently and which aim is to provide a common operational picture, um, taking information from the government networks, from government sources, but also from, from open media. Uh, so the planning. Uh, planning is done comprehensively. All the ministries and all the government agencies took part, uh, take part in this planning effort. It has, uh, as a basis, a commonly agreed threat assessment. So we agree on a threat assessment, threat scenarios, and it's the same for everybody. It's the same for the Minister of Culture, it's the same for the Minister of Economics or Minister of Defence. Um, it covers all those six areas I mentioned before, military defence, strategic communication, and so on and so forth. And it has both sides, so it has capability planning side and it has also contingency planning side. So the purpose of the capability planning is obviously to identify what are those capability needs throughout all those uh, different domains of national defence that we need to have in order to tackle the threats uh, to national security. And then in this planning effort, we need to decide on what are those priority capabilities that we need to put some money into and develop over the next 10 years. Contingency planning is a plan, basically a war plan for the nation. So what to do, what to do with those existing capabilities in a specific scenario? And as I said, all the ministries uh, take part in this effort. It's rather a new thing. We are kind of through the first phase of this planning effort. And it's really interesting to see how, let's say, the Minister of Social Affairs, who is not thinking about war and national security contingencies, is coming along, is kind of thinking along with you and trying to make sure that their capabilities and their actions are up to the, up to the level. Third element, exercises. So the government has conducted strategic tabletop exercises for a few years now. Uh, they take place once a year. And it's meant to exercise how the decision making works and also to teach the cabinet members what are the threats out there, what are the scenarios out there that you may realistically, realistically expect to see uh, in coming years. Also, uh, exercises are obviously conducted uh, on the field, so this year, in the spring of this year, we had the biggest exercise ever since our regaining independence in 1991. The exercise was called uh, SEAL in Estonian, Hedgehog in English. So it had 18,000 participants. Yes, majority of them came from the military and our home guard and allies, but a good portion also was from the law enforcement, police and border guard. So they could play through a scenario which is not only military, but which has other elements as well, a hybrid uh, scenario. And if, if you think about the size of this exercise, it amounts to 1.3% of the Estonian population, which is huge. I think it would make like 850,000 people exercising in UK. If you match this to the uh, population ratio, it's, it's massive. Um, fourth element, resilience. Here I would mention um, two things, civil protection, as well as uh, awareness in general in the, so in the society on national security matters. So uh, civil protection is rather new thing, new in this sense that it came up into the agenda only a few years ago. It had been forgotten for many, many years. Now it's in the agenda again, and the government has decided to pursue a number of projects uh, like alert systems, like mass education, like even shelters, um, uh, crisis communication, risk communication, and so on and so forth. 
So it's getting a lot of, a lot of attention uh, by the government. Raising awareness is very important, obviously. Um, there are three kind of existing uh, things that I think support raising awareness in Estonia in national security and defense matters. First is that uh, we have a pretty strong tradition of voluntary organizations like Defense League, which is our home guard. It has many, many members. Uh, it has women and uh, children organizations. So this is one of the vehicles that we can use to infuse this information in the population. Also, we have national defense courses or classes in our high schools. These are optional courses, but very popular. So students are taught um, the basic um, uh, skills, how to cope in a, um, uh, when you are lost in a forest, uh, the basic uh, knowledge about national defense structures, uh, foreign policy, threats, and so on and so forth. They're extremely popular in these days. And the third thing is that we have a course, copied actually from Finland, uh, for uh, our executives, people who are active in society, uh, politicians, journalists, uh, businessmen, and so on and so forth, national executive defense courses. And uh, they've been useful to uh, put this information out there for the leaders, for the people who really uh, care about the society and the development of Estonia. So uh, we do have a pretty solid framework, I would argue, for in legal sense and administrative sense for implementing the comprehensive national defense. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges as well. One of the challenges um, I would highlight here is how to give tasks and demand services from private sector companies that are very important, not only in peacetime, but also in times of war or in times of conflict. So there is a, an instrument available in Estonian law, assignment of national defense tasks. And uh, it's easy when it comes to the government agencies. Um, we can easily give those tasks. But to give those tasks for private companies, let's say for a mobile operator, to ensure that mobile services and telecommunication services are available, it becomes more tricky. These tasks need to be set in the law. So there is a lot of work to do uh, on this front. Um, also tasks to local municipalities. Another challenge I will highlight here. Again, we have to fix those tasks and functions in the law. The local municipalities always would ask some more money if they get some additional tasks. And it becomes um, automatically very polit political and politicized, this discussion. But obviously local municipalities, local communities are very important in making sure that we are resilient enough to face um, national security threats. So thank you. Um, I would conclude here.